All right. Well, hey, everybody. Welcome to the weekly live stream again, where we uh, challenge to just think deeply together, to think deeply about Christianity and where I bring on an expert in some topic and give you the chance to interact, learn more and become a better Christian ambassador and defender of the Christian faith. And today we have a, a unique discussion for you, one that actually I was kind of unaware of a little bit and had to do some of my own learning as well as just haven't really put it, heard it put the way it was put. And we're going to be talking about the topic of imaginative apologetics. I don't know how many of you are aware of that. I think apologetics in general is kind of an unknown term, but if you're watching this, you probably know what it is. But there are different areas of apologetics, one being imaginative apologetics. And that's what we're going to be discussing. And to talk about that, uh, joining me is Dr. Holly Ordway. She holds a PhD in English from the University of Massachusetts Amherst. She is the Fellow of Faith and Culture at the Word on Fire Institute, uh, where her writing and speaking focuses in on imaginative apologetics, as well as literary apologetics, and the work of J.R.R. Tolkien and C.S. Lewis, and I'm sure you love those books and know those authors as well. She's a visiting professor uh, at, of English in the apologetics program at Houston Baptist University, and has written books titled Apologetics and the Christian Imagination, an Integrated Approach to Defend the Faith, as well as Not God's Type, an Atheist Academic Lays Down Her Arms. And we'll definitely be discussing a little bit of those books as we hear her story. So Dr. Orway, thank you so much for coming on and joining me on the show this week. My pleasure. It's always fun to talk about the subject, and I'm glad to be here. Absolutely. So I think, you know, maybe we just start off right at the beginning, and this idea of imaginative apologetics, which I probably feel like I'm going to stumble over in my pronunciation, imaginative apologetics. Uh, what exactly is that? Uh, as we kind of quickly jump in and maybe just lay out a definition, and then we'll kind of work our way back to that topic in a little bit. Well, that's a great way to start, um, because, you know, as someone in my own teaching and work with apologists, Figuring out what do we mean by the words that we use is pretty much the first thing we need to do. And that's something that a lot of apologists kind of miss. They start leaping into a, a defense, say, of the resurrection, and they forget to check whether the person is maybe understanding what resurrection means versus, say, reincarnation. Yeah. So, you know, so that's a great question. Um, so when we talk about imagined apologetics, we want to think what's the role of the imagination. And most people, when they think of imagination, they think immediately of things that are imaginary, like, okay, you know, made up stories, they might be lots of fun. But imagination is actually a fundamental human faculty. It's just as much part of how we are made as our intellect, or as our emotions or our will. Because the imagination is actually that faculty in the human being that allows us to create meaning out of what we experience. So that sounds very abstract, um, but let me actually take a step back and give you an example of, of what that means. So your viewers today are watching this on their computers, and what they are watching is you and me having conversation, right? Yeah. Well. They're thinking about what we're saying, but the imagination had to process that information first because their senses, their eyes are giving them color and movement on the screen. Their ears are giving them sound waves. That's data. But just by itself, what, what does it mean? Um, it, it could be if your screen got all jumbled, you'd have pixels and you would realize it doesn't mean anything. And our imagination is what pulls that data together and makes it into a meaningful image and then it hands it over to the reason, and the reason is able to say, oh, yes, I agree, or, oh, no, I disagree, or I'm still confused. So the imagination is actually part of all of our process of reasoning. And so, for instance, if, if you're picking up a friend at the airport, um, which none of us are doing at the moment, <laughs> but uh, in, in happier times, we, we have and we will again, I pray. Yeah. You might be looking for somebody and your imagination might put together some sense data like height or color of movement. And actually, your reason might make the wrong judgment. And you might say, oh, that's Holly Ordway. I'm picking her up for a lecture. And then you realize that it's actually just somebody else who also has blonde hair. And then you're like kind of embarrassed and you realize you waited for the wrong person. Um, I've never so, done that. <laughs> yeah. So that's, that's where you have the imagination puts together, it takes the sense data, um, makes a picture out of it, hands it to the reason, and then the reason makes the judgment. So this is why imagination is so important in apologetics, because imagination is how we create meaning. Hmm. And until we have meaning for something, we literally cannot judge it with our reason. And 
you know, when we're talking about apologetics, you know, most of the time when people are talking about these issues, they think they know what they're ta- what they're what the words mean. Although they may not, you know, when someone says ascension, well, what what does that mean doctrinally? A lot of people who aren't Christians never even heard the word. And they're like, what? What does that even mean? But someone who, for instance, hears the word God, they might have a meaning for that word that's very different yeah. from what we yeah. as Christians understand, um, because they've put together a different picture. Yeah. So their imagination has given them a picture, for instance, of God as old man in the sky who's going to blast me if I say a bad word. Well, if that's the picture that the imagination is given, the reason has to make a judgment, is this believable or not? And the reason will quite correctly say, no, that's not believable, because it's not. But that's not the right picture. Hmm. And so a lot of what we need to do as apologists is discern when people have either no proper meaning or a faulty meaning, and we have to help them either create a meaning or correct the meaning, and then then we can actually have a discussion about these concepts. Because if we jump into discussion when we don't have proper meaning, we just talk past each other. Yeah. Waste yeah. of time. Absolutely. And I think, you know, that's one of the things that uh, we talk about, and, you know, and it's in Greg Kokel's book on tactics is, you know, what do you mean by that is a good question where, you know, a lot of times when people say, I don't believe in God. And if you ask the question, well, what do you mean by God? You get what you said, a big, you know, bully up in the sky with a big, long white beard that just wants to judge me all the time. And it's like, oh, well, I don't believe in that God either. Right? We have to realize people sometimes are thinking of a, a very different God. Now, um, I think it's important to point out, you know, when we talk about imaginative apologetics and this idea of using the Christian imagination to discover truths of Christianity, I feel like an atheist might quickly see this and go, of course, you know, Christians just always imagining things. So this is definitely not what we're talking about is just simply imagining things and therefore Christianity is true. That's not our approach to apologetics is imaginative apologetics. No, absolutely not. <laughs> and, and really, we have to make sure that as, as Christians, we need to understand the role of the imagination just as well. Mm-hmm. Because as Christians, you know, we've all got imaginations, but our imagination is always going to be at work. The question is, is it healthy or is it unhealthy? Is it forming correct meaning or incorrect meaning? And a lot of Christians, unfortunately, have gotten kind of so freaked out about the you know, unhealthy media out there in the world. And there's a lot of terrible stuff out there. There's a lot of books and movies and you know, music that give really wrong messages. But they've gotten so scared by that that they try to cut themselves off and say, well, I'm not going to I'm not going to have anything that's made up. I'm not going to have anything that's that's false. Mm-hmm. But unfortunately, what that does, it's like it's kind of like saying, well, I read in the newspaper that you can get, you know, E. coli and, and become really sick if you eat lettuce, you know, if, if you've got an infected, you know, shipment in your grocery store. Therefore, I will never eat fresh vegetables again in my life. Well, it's a legitimate thing. You want to be careful about not eating, you know, vegetables that haven't been like washed or that, you know, there's been a recall. But if you never eat any vegetables you're probably going to have an unhealthy diet. You're going to be a little weak, a little vitamin deficient. You're also going to miss out on a lot of tasty things, mm, you know, nice salads, with, you know, fresh, tasty things in them. Imagine your own favorite dishes here. Um, so I think it's, that's the case with the imagination. We have to ask ourselves, this is a faculty just like our intellect. Are we feeding it with nourishing food? Are we training it up as it should go the same way that we would, I hope, treat our intellect and our emotions because we can't just ignore it yeah. because if we yeah. do then it will become starved and unhealthy yeah absolutely well good that's i think a very good kind of introduction into you know what we're going to be talking about why the imagination is so important and how this relates into uh doing apologetics now i want to kind of take a step back and you know have people and myself as well and kind of get to know you a little bit more because uh, you re- you have written a book uh talking about an atheist academic laying down her arms so you are an adult convert to christianity apologetics has not always been that role but there's a cool way in which the imaginative apologetics kind of played a role in your conversion. So can you maybe take us back a little bit to your earlier days as a professor and kind of uh, your your testimony, your story, what led you to this point that you're at now? Absolutely. And really the reason that I'm so passionate about the subject is that I know firsthand just how important it is. Because as you noted, I'm an adult convert. Um, I became a Christian, you know, in my early 30s, um, 31, I think. Um, and 
at that point, I had been up until then a really hardcore atheist. Um, I was not, you know, I, I wasn't an agnostic. I really firmly believed God did not exist. Supernatural was just made up, it was stupid superstition, and that we were just bodies, and that when I died, I was just going to, you know, have my consciousness sniff, sniff out, and then I was going to degenerate into my component molecules. Pretty grim, but that's what I believe was true, and I've always felt that one should embrace what's true, whether or not you like it. So I had a, a pretty firmly atheistic view. So up until then, you know, what would possibly have made me consider that Christianity was true? Certainly not the Christians that I had encountered, because I was so sort of fixated that it was silly superstition that I just thought, well, I'm not even going to bother with that. Um, and it didn't help. And here we have this idea of meaning again, that I thought the word faith meant believing something that you know isn't true. Well, I, I can't do that. Couldn't then, can't now. But that's what I thought it was. So I thought, well, you know, too bad for me. Uh, so how did I get to the point where I became a Christian? And here we have to go back to when I was a little girl. Um, from my earliest ages, I have loved to read. And some of the books that were most important to me were folk tales, fairy tales, C.S. Lewis's Chronicles of Narnia, J.R. Tolkien's The Hobbit, The Lord of the Rings. Um, these are books that really, I loved them. They nourished my imagination. Um, and I had no idea that these were Christian books at all. That, for instance, I had no idea, like the only child in America who had no idea that Aslan was Jesus. Like literally no idea. Because um, my family was not was at all. Yeah. We never, completely, I mean, not hostile. Um, I became hostile when I was in college, but my family, completely not religious. You know, never, I, I literally never went to a church service until after I had professed myself a Christian. So, wow. uh so I, but I had read all these books, right? Um, and I found them deeply meaningful, deeply just rich, even though I didn't know why. Um, fast forward on a little bit, um, I became much more firm as an atheist when I was doing my first master's degree, went to do my PhD um, at UMass Amherst, did my PhD on fantasy literature centered on J.R.R. Tolkien um, and The Lord of the Rings and his great essay called On Fairy Stories. And that's an essay that I had read when I was a teenager, probably about 14, 15 years old. And it had deeply moved me and continued to move me ever since, every time I read it, as did The Lord of the Rings. Now, interestingly, in On Fairy Stories, Tolkien, who was a devout Christian, um, actually puts a presentation of the gospel in the epilogue. He says that the gospels are a kind of fairy story that also happens to be true. And that the reason that we respond to the happening of fairy tales is precisely because they are an echo of the resurrection of Christ. He says that's why we respond that way. So that was really sort of interesting. You know, I was connecting with that. I found The Lord of the Rings to be a deeply meaningful book, even though I didn't believe any of the things that he talked about were really true. So that actually led me to start kind of beginning to think, okay, you know, I don't believe these things, but maybe it would be interesting to find out what does somebody like Tolkien actually believe? Uh, so I got my PhD. This was a long process. Got my PhD, got my first teaching job. I was teaching college literature, and I began to teach the great Christian poets who I had read as an undergrad and graduate student, now I'm teaching them, John Donne, Gerard Manley Hopkins, T.S. Eliot, folks like that, the Anglo-Saxon poets. And again, they're deeply Christian, and they're writing Christian poetry that deals with Christian themes, and I, I found finally that I couldn't dismiss them the way that I had always dismissed living Christians, because these were people whose work I respected, I loved, I admired, it moved me, it was what I had done my entire, you know, academic career on. So at that point, I thought, I, you know, I want to find out what these people actually believe. And they had, what I realized later, knew these stories. For instance, Tolkien had helped me to have a, a sense of meaning for things like good and evil, that they mattered. You know, and Lewis in the Chronicles of Narnia had given me a sense of who Jesus might be, what the incarnation might be like. 
Um, so it was meaningful. It wasn't just some stupid idea. So then when I began finally, and God's providentially put me in a place where I could do this, I began to investigate the actual questions. Does God exist? Did the resurrection happen? Um, I was willing to actually be open to these things being true. And I they were convincing. Yeah. And really I owed to my imagination having you know, had that preliminary work done in it and 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 ongoing. You know, these writers have continued to help me understand what it means to pray, what it means to love God. Uh, so this this sense of meaning making is something that is, is deeply important to me because yeah. I could I saw how it was what allowed me to ask the questions that led me into the church. Yeah. So what were your initial thoughts? So you, as you said, you read these Christian poets when you're an undergrad and a graduate student. Were your initial thoughts were, ah, oh, well, here's some good poetry, but, you know, the people are confused? Or uh, as an atheist, what were you thinking initially about those that poetry? When I first read um, some of these poets um, or, or read, for instance, you know, C.S. Lewis um, as a teenager, um, I just didn't know what they were talking about because I, I literally had no background. Uh, so, you know, I read, you know, Gerard Manley Hopkins' wonderful poem, The Wind Hover, which is subtitled To Christ Our Lord. And it's a beautiful meditation on Christ as a meditation on a circling hawk. It's just wonderful. And the funny thing is that it deeply moved me. Um, I didn't understand it, but Hopkins is such a great poet that his language, his imagery really stirred something in, in my heart in my imagination, even though I really had no idea. Christ was just a word. Um, yeah. Then later on, when I had you know, gotten you know, my 20s, I had gotten into my, my hostile atheist phase, my attitude was kind of condescending. It was, okay, these guys are mistaken, and you know, they're, they're uneducated is kind of what I would try to say, but that's a really weird thing to say about some of these, some of these authors. I said, well, they're, back then, I would say, think these condescending things. But I had to recognize that the, that the literature, the work itself, was objectively beautiful. So I would kind of try to separate it out and say, well, this is beautiful, but, but I think this is the magic of really great literature that ultimately you can't separate the meaning from the beauty because, you know, why is the Lord of the Rings so compelling? Yeah. Well, yeah. it's because it's so deeply infused with Tolkien's Christian faith and it's a brilliant piece of writing. It's yeah. both those yeah. things. You can't pull them apart now. And that I think is one of the reasons why, um, it's, it's something actually that Word on Fire, one of the principles that Word on Fire has, this is my, where I work now, um, is to lead with beauty because God has the characteristics of you know, truth, goodness, and beauty. Uh, and one of the things that Bishop Barron, um, the founder of Word on Fire, always says is that in our modern day, people will resist claims of the good because they think you're being judgmental. And they'll resist claims of truth because they're relativists, so they think they are. But beauty kind of gets under people's skin. It's subversive. You think you can take it in and not deal with goodness or truth. Hmm. But in fact, because all those things are God's attributes, once beauty really gets its teeth in you, as it were, it draws you on to questions of goodness and questions of truth, which is what happened with me. Yeah. So I think with, with literature, you know, any good art, there can be a long time delay where something something affects you and you might not even know what it means, but it's there and the beauty is connected to the goodness and the truth. And <laughs> Yeah. Seed. Yeah, and that, that's one thing I love about my work with Maven and Brett Kunkel is is it's focused on that on knowing truth, pursuing goodness, and creating beauty. And I think often one thing that it's often left off uh, sometimes in Christianity is, is hey, as long as it's true, talks about Jesus, we're good. And it's like, hey, what about also creating just beautiful literature, beautiful uh, you know poetry and and um, paintings and and artwork and those sort of things. And that's something that we can truly reflect God and his beauty and, and who he is in what we do and we, what we create. And that's one thing I love, you know, uh, when I talk on entertainment with students and you're able to show clips of movies or read little things that, that there's not much to them. And there's no action, there's no explosions, there's not that kind of stuff. But then they can see just something that is truly beautiful as it reflects on some deep aspect of life. And it sometimes it moves us in such a powerful way uh, what film and, and movies and, and literature can do to us. 
Now I know that you've also mentioned in your story that that you were the 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 atheist English professor that is maybe the reason why some people don't want to send their kids to colleges. Christian people don't want to send their kids to public colleges. Is that is that a way you would describe yourself? Yes, um, because I was you know I I was a college professor and I you know I completely believed that uh, that atheism was true. And that my Christian students were all completely mistaken. So there I was, you know, definitely a hardline atheist. And that's, and I'm sure I was the kind of figure that would make those Christians' parents kind of cringe. But I do want to say in my defense um, that even when I was an atheist, I always felt that it was wrong to try to bully my students and, you know, try to convince them that, that their beliefs were wrong. Yeah, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't afraid to say, well, no, I'm, I'm not a Christian, I'm not a believer. But I, I've always felt that you can't force people, you have to invite them. Um, and, and I think back, you know, in my, in my teaching, cause I taught for a number of years at a secular community college and I, I really respect the colleagues I had there. Some of whom were again, hardline atheists. I was a Christian at that point. Some of them were hardline atheists, but they respected their students. Um, and I, I kind of want to give a shout out to, you know, don't, assume that because a college professor is an atheist that they're a jerk um i'm gonna sort of get on a little soapbox here because i've been in that place yeah. um and and it's interesting too because um teaching at a secular school um i especially you know i, I also when i was a christian i didn't want to be proselytizing I, you know i didn't want to be making my atheist students feel uncomfortable either. This is, it was a secular school. And I remember there were a few instances in which I had a Christian student in class who I think didn't realize I was a Christian and would start to kind of give me a hard time. I'm like, kid, just, just don't even, just don't even. And I really, speaking as a, as a, you know, former professor, um, I am concerned with the stereotype that people sometimes have of the evil atheist professor, um, because that encourages people, first of all, to have a bad attitude about their professors, and it can lead them actually to become a bad witness to those people. Because mm. I can tell you, as a college professor, if I have a kid in class who's arguing with me in class, that's disrupting my class. Yep. That's yep. making it impossible for me to do the education that they've come to my class to get. So it's not appropriate to have an argument in that sense. Meet with the freshman office hours, have a discussion there, absolutely. But and I had I had conversation with atheist kids in my office hours where they wanted to ask these questions. But where, if they were going to argue with me in class, they say, "Oh, see me after class, we'll chat." So I think a lot of what sometimes Christian kids or their parents think they ought to do is actually provoking a negative reaction to the professor, not because they're atheists, but because the kids disrupt in the class and they've got to maintain authority over the class or else the rest of the students are going to have a, a bad education. If yeah. the professor doesn't have control of the class, you know, game over. Yeah. Um, and then they blame it on an angry professor or something. Oh, the man, the professor cut me off and I was trying to share or something. So, exactly. so your advice to students, you know, I'm thinking of my seniors who are about to graduate, go off to college. Uh, so your advice to students going off is, you know, if they have atheist professor, even one that's a little bit, uh, you know, more uh, trying to convince students of certain beliefs is uh, classroom is not the place. Go to office hours, but maybe yeah. ask appropriate questions in the class that are relevant. Absolutely. You know, if, for instance, if the class is, you know, depends on the class, if the class is having a discussion on a topic where the Christian point of view is relevant, absolutely bring that point of view up, do it respectfully, do it in a way that you feel comfortable that someone else could take this, a different point of view and put it in the same way. Um, and don't, don't pick a fight in the classroom, basically. Um, and even if, you know, even if your professor's a jerk, don't, don't take that as permission to be a jerk yourself. Yeah. Um, that's not a Christian thing to do. Yeah. And again, we have to realize that there are, um, you know, levels of authority. Sometimes some professors do behave in ways that are wrong, like giving a failing grade for taking a certain perspective in an essay. Well, in that case, well, the first thing to do is take it to the dean or take it to the um, department chair. If the department chair doesn't respond, take it to the dean, take it to the provost, go through the chain of command because chances are, there's going to be somebody who's going to say, hey, that's just not fair treatment of a student, you know. And if that doesn't work, then do your best. 
be a witness by, you know, turning the other cheek is what I would say. Yeah, that's good. Now, so you mentioned in uh, kind of in sharing your story, uh, the, the understanding of first having to recognize and seeing the imagination and seeing the Christian story played out in Chronicles of Narnia and these different books, uh, and then being able to test the reason and is this actually true? Is this connected in any way to like the idea of cognitive dissonance or, or, or not cognitive dissonance, sorry, the uh, plausibility structures? Where like if someone comes up to me and says, "Hey, come to my flatter society meeting," I'm just gonna go, "No, nah, I'm, I'm not even interested in that." Like because that is just not even uh, reasonable. I don't even think it's possible. Therefore, I'm not interested to he to actually hearing arguments. Is that a, kind of you first have to imagine this is possible, and if it's not even possible, then you're out. Is is it related to that? Absolutely, because we make judgments about things based on lots of different pieces of information that come together. Um, it's you know, part of what uh, St. John Henry Newman calls um, the illative sense. We, we build up a picture of, of the world based on lots of things, little pieces of information, authority of others, our own intuitions. I mean, for instance, you know, how do you know that the coastline of America has the shape that it does? Have you seen it yourself, every inch of it? I think not. Nope. I doubt it anyway. But you're going to accept that it is because you've had, presumably, as I have, you know, visited certain parts of the coast. You know that if you head west far enough, you do get the Pacific Ocean. You know, you have friends there. You've seen in pictures. You have authority. It all builds up. Um, so you have, a, again, a like you said, a plausibility structure. Um, so then if somebody says, oh, you know, we just discovered a new island, you, you try to fit it in. Okay, we're, how likely is that? Where is this alleged island? You know, could it could it be? And I think part of the problem with apologetics today is that we have a culture that has so lost the basic foundational structures of, of just basic knowledge about Christianity and about theism, really, yeah. Yeah. that it's as if people have no idea that, you know, that, that America has coasts. Like, what, isn't it just all land? It's all land all the way around. What's, what's wrong with you? So, of course, we, we present these ideas, and they've got nothing to, nothing to hold on to. They don't fit anywhere. Because we are offering a, a view that's so radically different in so many ways to everything they believe that, yeah, it's like saying, yeah, kind of the flat earth society. And it's no use saying, well, come and just find out, because if we did that, we would waste all of our time going to all sorts of stupid meetings because <laughs> sometimes some ideas are just stupid. Like the flat earth idea. No, the earth is round. Just get over it. <laughs> <laughs> so we have to actually to have uh, some sympathy. We have to put ourselves, you know, use theory of mind and put ourselves in the mental place of these people. It's actually a, quite a reasonable reaction to say, yeah, fine, you believe your thing, but but no, just no. So we have to find ways to invite them to begin to see that this structure that we offer actually makes more sense of the world than theirs. Yeah. And that really is what happened with me, with the sense that the Christian view that I was getting from, say, Tolkien and Lewis and the poets, that view about morality made much more sense because as an atheist, I still had a very strong sense that it was important to do good, avoid evil, you know, don't be a jerk, um, that sort of thing. I felt that. I had that intuition. And this is from, you know, natural law. I, I knew mm -hmm. that. But I had no way to explain it. Um, so I had to just say, I, I guess it just kind of evolved, which didn't really work because actually ad it would be more advantageous to the individual to you know, lie, cheat, and steal if they can get it their way. Yeah. So I, I just had to kind of hand wave. But it was the gradual sense that here in this Christian worldview, there was a, a way that goodness, truth, and beauty actually fit together that, that rang true with my own moral intuitions, including my own sense of failure, that gave me that initial plausibility structure gained imaginatively without any reference to actual claims but it meant that i could consider the idea of god as the source of morality and it would have a connection yeah yeah absolutely so it really is i mean it, 
that's why worldviews are so important is because many of the people we talk to are so ingrained in a materialistic, naturalistic worldview where the only the material world exists that the moment you try to appeal to some sort of external transcendent mind that created all things, uh, it's just, you're out the window. Uh, and, you know, and sometimes I think Christians don't understand this. When I'm talking with students, I'm often like, Dude, I, I try to think of something else crazy. Like imagine if someone invited you to, to a, I, I've heard, I don't remember where I heard the example, but, you know, to the, the church of Peter Pan, where they sang songs to Peter Pan and they, and they, and they worship the, you know, little fairy that fl flies around and all this kind of stuff. It's like, you would laugh at that. You would never spend your time going and spending three hours every Sunday or two hours every Sunday going to that church because it's just nonsense to you. And is it possible that your friends who you're trying to invite to church or who are criticizing Christianity, think of it the exact same way. Uh, they don't see it is even possible. Their worldview is completely ruled it out. And therefore, it's just like you're going to some P church of Peter Pan. Very similar. Yeah. Now, Unfortunately, that's, that is often often the case. Yeah. Um, and so we can make a very strong case, uh, both logically, for a dualistic view uh, and uh, foundations of Christianity, but then also just be able to wrap that in story and in, in different ways to help them just be able to see and perceive like, wow, this is possible. Now, this is obviously, as you have shared here, this is a big part in your story and your conversion. Uh, but you also say that this has actually played a huge, a big role in uh, the story of C.S. Lewis, which many people know, and he's written Mere Christianity. So can you share a little bit uh, with us for those who maybe don't know the history of C.S. Lewis? We, uh, we I think most of us would say, yeah, he was an atheist and became a Christian. But how did the role of imagination actually play a role in the conversion of C.S. Lewis? Yeah, I and mean, this is, it's something I feel connection to because his, his journey was actually in many ways a lot like mine, which I didn't realize until after the fact. So he was raised sort of nominally Christian, um, became an atheist as a teenager um, out of reaction mostly to the death of his mother, just tremendously traumatic for him. And then his, his father sent him away to uh, a boarding school that was just horrible. In fact, it was so, it was really so horrible. Um, the headmaster was eventually certified insane. Um, it was that bad. So he had a terrible experience um, and he just rejected Christianity altogether, became a thoroughgoing atheist um, and eventually became convinced um, of theism um, through philosophy. Uh, as a young man at Oxford, he became just convinced that there was a, a God, um, but he wasn't a Christian. He, he accepted a philosophical God, um, a creator, a, a source of morality, but he didn't he, he didn't, couldn't accept Christianity. And there's a very interesting bit in one of his letters. He writes to his friend, Arthur Greaves, that he understands what Christians mean by things like incarnation and atonement. But he says he has trouble accepting what the doctrines mean. And I've, I've always found that to be a really fascinating distinction because he knew the dictionary definition in a sense. You know, he, he was a very, you know, very well educated. He knew what the what the words meant, but he says he didn't understand what the doc, doctrines meant, you know, in a, in a robust sense. And that led him to sort of see his reason and his his imaginative sense as being two hemispheres, two separate hemispheres. Um, and it was this that um, his friend J.R.R. Tolkien um, helped him with, because he became friends with Tolkien, um, who was a lifelong Christian, um, very devout, uh, had a devout mother, um, and Tolkien had befriended this, you know, atheist philosopher, C.S. Lewis, and was trying to help him, convince him that this was actually true. And there was one walk they took on the grounds of Magdalen College in Oxford with another friend, Hugo Dyson, um, where they began talking about myth and, and story, and what Tolkien argued to Lewis, which ultimately helped convince him, was that he pointed out that that Lewis was finding all of these stories of the you know paganness to be deeply meaningful. You know, they're moving, they're beautiful, and they're not true. And here's the story of Christ rising from the dead. And Tolkien points out, look, this is exactly the same kind of story as those other stories that you love so much. But with one difference, it actually happened. And that enabled the breakthrough for Lewis that he was able to make the connection to say, oh, all these things I loved about the story of it, I don't have to leave those behind. They're actually part of the truth of Christianity. He didn't have to separate reason and imagination. 
they were they were together. Um, and then he was relatively soon after that able to come to that next step and say, yes, Jesus rose from the dead. He's Lord. Christianity is true. And and then he ends up becoming, you know, the, the greatest Christian apologist of the 20th century. Yeah. So. Yeah. yeah. Now, C.S. Lewis, I've heard him, you know, uh, people quote something, he says something like the myth that's actually true or the true myth or something. And we go, I think for a lot of people, it's like, well, that makes no sense. A true myth. Uh, what does he mean there by the word myth and, and by true myth? Yeah, it's a great question. And the word myth is one of those words that, again, people often have the wrong idea about. Now, Lewis was a literary critic. So am I. Um, myth has a particular meaning in literature, and it means a story that has sort of deep resonance. Um, and myths also have certain particular characteristics. They're usually set in sort of a past that's unspecified. It's long ago, but not exactly sure when. It's somewhere, but not exactly sure where. Um, and so it's almost like iconic in the story. And the key feature of a myth is that it has a sort of resonance with deep issues, you know, deep emotions or deep cycles of life. So the Greek myths are just marvelous stories, um, and they really ev they evoke, you know, some of the the greatest themes of, of humanity, you know, dying and rising and spring and new life and you know all these things. And they're just they're set in a you know, some long past somewhere, they're, they're not things that actually happened. Um, but the part that makes the myth is that, is that resonance, that feeling that they, they have something that's true on a sort of conceptual level. Um, so for instance, the, you know, the myths about, you know, um, say Persephone going down to Hades, you know, um, and she's, she's captured by Hades and she's you know, kidnapped and brought down to the underworld and she's able to, you know, make her way out again, but she's eaten some pomegranate seeds. And so she has to come back for a certain number of months each year. And that's how in the myth, that's the associated with the seasons when she's down in Hades, um, it's winter when she's back up again, it's, you know, spring and summer. And there's a, a real beauty there to seeing the cycle of the seasons, the feeling that, that when winter comes, um, there is a sense of dying. You know, the leaves are dying. We have a feeling of loss. When spring and summer arrive, we feel like new life is arising. There's a richness of, of truth there, but it's a conceptual truth. And that's where a myth can be actually quite deeply important. It can actually have a kind of truth, not a historical truth, but a conceptual truth. Now, what Tolkien pointed out to Lewis is that the Christian myth, because the Christian story is a myth in that sense, it's a deeply resonant story, touches us in our deepest emotions, and it's also history. Hmm. It's, it's the true myth. It's the myth that actually has a specific time that it happened in, a specific place that it happened in, eyewitnesses to it, yet it has all of the mythic resonance and all of the historical reality. That's what makes it the true myth. And I think, you know, we need to recover a sense of myth as a positive because we, we're, we're too quick to say, you know, oh, you know, five myths about online shopping or something. They're all you know, five <laughs> mistakes that we make. And, and that's a corruption of, of the word myth. And in fact, actually a little you know, heads up for your, for your, for your listeners. I'm actually going to be working on a new book in the next couple of years um, on verbicide, which tackles mistaken meanings like that. So myth might well be one of those words. Yeah. We, we have this idea of myth as like, oh, you know, a falsehood. And so when someone talks about the Christian myth, I think we too quickly get defensive and say, no, 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 it happened. When we might actually be cutting off an extremely fruitful conversation mm. because maybe that person sees it as a story that they don't yet think happened in history, but they sense the power of it. They sense the meaningness of it, meaningfulness of it. It's, it's speaking to them. Um, and I think we see this, for instance, in Jordan Peterson. You know, he's, he's talking about the Christian story evidently at this point doesn't believe it actually happened. But golly, he sure finds it meaningful. He's drawn to it. That's wonderful. You know, is he a Christian? No. Um, is he doing a very great service in helping people who are also not Christians start to look at this and say, wow, this is a story that 
that speaks to me, I wonder if it might actually have happened. And that's where we can come in and say yes to all of the mythic resonance and say yes and it's also history. Not no, but yes and. And I think that's a really powerful rule of the imagination to say all that mythic resonance and all the historical truth. So what would you say then, uh, maybe is, I don't know if, you, if lacking is the right word, but what would you say to the person who says, uh, well, I just, I know that Christianity is true, there's evidence for it, I believe it, and therefore I follow it, and, and kind of is, is, is missing the imagination side of Christianity? Well, I would say that that's an area where there's a lot of opportunity for, for real growth. Um, partly, I think, because when we get into a, a crisis situation, we have a loss of a loved one. We have, you know, a, a, a sickness, um, a, a, you know, some sort of disaster, something really terrible happens. We need to really have a firm grasp of, of the truth of the faith that, you know, God is, is with us in this, that there's meaning to it. We can offer up our suffering. And these are things that if you've only got a head knowledge, it's very easy to let that slip away. Um, if the head knowledge hasn't made its way into a, a sort of holistic grasp of, yes, this is this is really true. Um, and I think that's one of the ways that it's important to really have that imaginative grasp so that you, you feel it. Um, you know, for instance, I think sometimes people wonder about um, Catholics and, and having crucifixes. Um, they may have the mistaken idea that like, well, you know, Jesus is risen. So why should we look at him on the cross? Well, we know he's risen. <laughs> we celebrate that every Sunday. Um, but the point of looking at a crucifix is to remember what he went through for us, that that suffering that he endured on, on Good Friday is the means of our salvation. So I've got a crucifix over my, uh, my desk here in my, in my office. And so when I look at that, you know, it reminds me. You know, he's been there. Whatever suffering that I might experience, he's been there. He's felt it and worse. He's, he's gone through it. And the, the image helps be that reminder, that imaginary reminder, that our Lord really, truly in the flesh suffered those wounds and that humiliation, that torture for me. And I think that can be really powerful in sustaining our faith when maybe... You know, we've just gotten so sideswiped by some tragedy that that the intellectual arguments feel hollow. Hmm. Absolutely, and just it, that it's so relatable, right? We we think of it. Oh, this book is so old; it doesn't relate to me, and it's, it doesn't have anything relevant to my life. And it's like, man, have you read it? <laughs> like, <laughs> not only on the surface level can you say, well, it talks about money and how to handle finances. Do you have money? Yeah. It talks about friends and honoring your parents. Do you have parents and friends? Yeah. Okay. You know, but there is so much deeper. Uh, of just the purpose and meaning of life and, and, and what we go through at deep, uh, just deep levels that, that it has so much to speak into and really is, is such a powerful book, right? It's a book filled with power and people often don't recognize the power that it has because they don't actually read it and, and are not experiencing it in that sense. Yeah, and I would say too that, you know, if we, if we kind of turn off our imagination, we're not going to understand scripture, you know, let alone engage with it. We're not going to understand it. Because our Lord, you know, he tells parables um, and, and God saw fit that when he inspired the human writers of scripture, I mean, he, if he had wanted to, he could have inspired just straight up theology, you know, he could have. There's no reason why he, you know, he could have done any way he liked. But what do we actually have? We have books of poetry. We've got psalms and lamentations. Um, we've got, you know, histories, obviously, but we've got proverbs and, you know, apocalyptic literature. You know, it's, the genres are all over the place. Mm -hmm. And I think that just looking, for instance, at the Psalms, I mean, they're the prayer book of the Bible. Um, and I think you know, it's really important to be reading the Psalms regularly because they go through the whole gamut of human experience and they're so imaginatively rich. So it's like here we have God in his holy word giving us all this imagery, all these imaginative ways to understand him and his relationship with us. Well, the way I figured it is if, if God is going to inspire poetry that invites us to engage imaginatively to come to know him better, who are we to say, Sam, yeah, good, thanks, don't need that. <laughs> yeah. So... Um, when we think about this idea, I, I, um, 
we well you, you talk about this idea of of we we mistake words right we have these different ideas of what words mean and you and you talk about why this is so important in the church to have our imagination turned on and and the imagination uh, gives uh, meaning and and it helps us understand and so there's also just a, a misunderstanding with a lot of definitions in the church as you as you've talked about before so how how is this approach of using this imaginative apologetics how does that play into uh, helping us understand the true, deep theological truths of what it means to pray and how God loves us and sanctification, justification, and, and these type uh, of important concepts that we should lo- learn as we grow deeper in our faith. Yeah, well, I think, first of all, we have to step back and say, do we really have a rich meaning for these words? Um, for instance, one of the words that I come across often um, is one of the things you just mentioned, um, prayer, is one of the most deeply misunderstood words that Christians use including among Christians. Um, I find that a lot of, when I hear stories of people's crises of faith, um, and I've heard a lot of them, oftentimes it goes something like this. I had a loved one who had cancer. I prayed that they would be healed. God didn't answer the prayer. My loved one died. I left the faith faith for a certain number of years. If I'm talking to them, they they maybe come back, but so many other people just didn't. And this stems to a fundamentally a mistake about the meaning of prayer because people think of prayer only as intercession um, and they only think of it in terms of I'm going to ask God for what I want and if I get it the prayer is answered if I don't get it God has not answered my prayer and that's such a shallow meaning of prayer and what I like to give as an example is it's basically treating God as an ATM machine. You put in your card, you punch out what you want, and it spits out the cash. Um, and if you don't get the cash, it means that there is no money in the account. Oh, you know. Well, that, but that's, that's, not, that's not the right imaginative model for who God is. But a lot of Christians have fundamentally this idea of God as the ATM machine. And that means that when they're praying, they're actually – kind of judging God, you know, he's, is he going to give me what I want? He didn't give me what I wanted, therefore I hate him or he doesn't exist. Forgetting that answers to prayer can be, yes, what you asked for. Yes, what you asked for, but not now. Yes, what you asked for, but not in the way that you asked, in some better way that I have planned. No, because it wouldn't actually have been good for you after all. No, because there's some better plan that you don't understand and maybe won't, you know, until you get to heaven or, you know, maybe like part of what you asked for and part of it not because God's personal. He's relating to us. And that understanding of an accessory prayer just makes it completely different when we're praying for something that we deeply want and something good, you know, praying for someone's healing friends is a good thing to pray for. But what does it mean when God doesn't, answer it in the way that we expect or we want. Um, and I think if we have a, a richer understanding of prayer as relational, we'll say, okay, okay, God, this isn't what I was expecting, but okay, let's help me understand this. Let's work with this. Let's go forward with this. Very different um, than, oh, God didn't answer my prayer. Yeah. And I, and I think yeah. it, it, it hurts a lot of people to have this particular misunderstanding. Yeah. Now you also talk about how we just have so much information flowing around us. And the problem is not that we have a lack of information. And we kind of pointed this out a little bit earlier, but I want to kind of highlight it again is, is it's not the lack of information, but it's that this information doesn't have any meaning. And so we just ignore it or we forget about it, or it just kind of slips through and we don't even realize it. Uh, So again, how is this approach of imaginative apologetics actually putting meaning to the information that's, that's around us? Yeah, I mean, that's that's the big thing. We, we have to actually process this information. It has to have a context. It has to have some some substance to it. Um, and then we can, well, first of all, then we'll start to care whether it's true or false. Because, I mean, you know, do I care to hear the arguments of the flat earth society? No, not really. Um, do we care, does someone care whether Christianity can make these arguments if, if, if it has no relevance for them? No, they're, they're not going to be interested. First, we have to care. Then we'll ask, is it true or is it not true? Um, and I think that is a, is a crucial first step. People have to be interested. Yeah. Yeah. They have to want to know before they're going to hear it. And I, I think sometimes in, in a kind of you know understandable eagerness, 
we try to jump too quickly to the argument stage when people haven't yet become interested and then they're like, okay, buddy, just back off, back off. You know, say, I know you have great arguments, but no. It's like, okay, we have, we have to be willing to cultivate that, that attention. Yeah. So, uh, well, uh, I was say, how do we then get people to care? Uh, maybe, yeah, I mean, I'm thinking about this in a, in a different way, but it seems like uh, if we think about the basic sense, our imagination, kids have a good imagination, as they, but as we grow up, we kind of lose that sense of imagination. We kind of, and going back to worldviews, we have this understanding that, well, no, you use your imagination when you haven't seen or explored something. Once you've seen or explored it, then you don't need your imagination anymore because you've just seen it, right? And kind of that plays in the worldview. So how do we get people to kind of re-engage their imagination to, to see the meaning and significance of Christianity so that they're even willing to hear the arguments that we have to present? Yeah, and that, really, that, that is a fundamental challenge. Um, but I want to step back to the, what I said at the beginning, because people are using their imaginations all the time, whether they know it or not, as they're taking in their processing information. I think a lot of the time the problem is that they, they don't have the right data and they're not interpreting it in the right way. So we have to not so much get the imaginations engaged necessarily as give them some better data and show them some other possible ways that the imagination can fit those pieces together. So, you know, personal witness is huge. Um, it really is. Um, I don't think that personal witness is necessarily going to convert somebody right off the bat. Um, but what it can do is it can give a picture. It can say, look, here is somebody living a life that I like, that I can see is, is attractive, it's wholesome, it's beautiful. Um, I'm interested. I'm, I'm finding it engaging. Why? How do they live that way? Why do they make these decisions? And that's actually imaginative engagement. They're making these connections. They're saying, here's this life. Here's my life. How can I, how can I reconcile these two things? Um, or, you know, that's one reason why stories of, of heroic Christians, you know, the saints, the, the great heroes of the faith are, are important. Why biographies are important, because it gives us pictures of, oh, look, here are people who are Christians and they're, they're interesting. This is one of the great lies of the devil that, that Christians are boring. Like, oh, come on, look at the history of the faith. Christians are so diverse. So that actually is a sort of a practical way to start laying some imaginative grounds, just trying to expose people to more examples of Christian lives or point out that more people who they already admire are Christians. Like, you know, how many people realize that Newton was a Christian? How many people realize that the, the person who discovered the Big Bang was a Catholic priest? Um, that Gregor Mendel, who discovered the principles of heredity, another Catholic priest, you know, uh, Francis Crick, um, you know, famous scientist, he's a Christian. You know, we have lots of interesting Christians, even just, you know, in the sciences, which is usually an area people people get hung up on. Look, these are you know, these are Christians. You know, all the great artists and writers and explorers and you know, philosophers. You know. This doesn't make Christianity true. Yeah. You can't just yeah. say we have more guys than you. It, it, <laughs> but because, do we? No. <laughs> well, we probably do. <laughs> well, it wouldn't. We wouldn't accept it the other way around. If there were a million atheists and one Christian, it wouldn't make Christianity any less true. Yeah. So we have to be fair, right? But what it can do is it can say, look at all these really different, interesting people. You know, if Thomas Aquinas and Francis of Assisi totally different people in every possible way um you know how how do we reconcile the fact that they all believe you know this weird thing about christ and look here are these christians who are involved in the arts and the sciences and doing all these things and some of them you know one way some of them another and yet they're all christians well i guess maybe christians aren't all just like cookie cutter and boring after all Again, this is imaginatively enriching the ground so that they're maybe ready to say, huh, I wonder what these guys all have in common after over, you know, all these centuries. I wonder, and that I wonder can kind of open the door. Yeah, absolutely. And I've seen that before in, in, in students where it's like, you know, Christianity's dumb. I reject it. Science is where it's at. And then you bring in like a you know, Hiros or, you know, Jeff Rank or some, someone like that as a Christian scientist and astrophysicist. And it's like, Wait, you are a PhD astrophysicist doing research at UCLA, like Jeff Swearing does, 
and you're a Christian and you believe that God, like, it's like, hold on. It's like uh, this whole new world of possibilities just opens up uh, again, where that maybe now we start to investigate those questions. Now we don't have a ton of time left, um, but you know, so you go back to some of these questions of, you know, what does it mean to have faith in God? Um, and, uh, you know, what does it mean when we say God loves us? And, and so sometimes, you know, putting a story to this and helps us understand what it means to forgive, what it means to repent. You kind of tie in a little bit in the, the, the story of the prodigal son, right? Which many of us know. So how, how would you kind of, again, using even Jesus used tons of parables. Maybe Jesus was doing imaginative apologetics, right? Tons of parables. How, how would you tie in the prodigal son to help someone see deep Christian truths like forgiveness, repentance, God's love for us and those sort of things? Well, you couldn't have a better example because I actually talk about that exact parable in my book, Apologetics and the Christian Imagination. There you go. And it's a great it's a great example because really, and I think our Lord really is the first imaginative apologist because he's telling the story. And he could have just said, okay, folks, listen up. God loves you. And if you repent and return to him, he will forgive you. Absolutely true. Completely true life-changing if you act on it, but does it connect? What does it mean? Um, and that, I think, is what the parable of the prodigal son does, because we can relate. We can, I think, relate to a lot of different characters, whether it's the elder brother or the younger brother. We kind of feel that, that cycle of the, of the, um, the, the story. You know, he gets the downward spiral. There's that wonderful detail where he's, he's looking at the food the pigs are eating, and he's saying, golly, I wish I could eat some of that. I mean, it's just such a vivid detail. You, you feel like he's really hit bottom. And then he, then he goes back. Um, he's rehearsing in his mind. This is what I'm going to say. Again, very realistic. You know, how many of us have been there? We've got we've got to apologize to somebody and we're trying to rehearse like, okay, this is what I'm going to say. I, I hope I hope they're not going to be too mad at me. And then the father comes running, running out to meet him. It doesn't even let him get through his, his talk. And there's a vividness to it. Um, so that gives us a picture, you know, the, the, the sort of, you know, shame faced son coming forward, um, and the father just running out and, you know, embracing him. And that's a picture that really is worth a thousand words because it gives you a feel for it. You, you've kind of been there, you've been with the son, you feel the father's embrace. And so it helps you feel this is what it's like to experience the Father's love. And especially, I think it's important, you know, in our modern day to realize that a lot of people, you know, they haven't experienced a Father's love. You know, how many people come from broken homes, you know, from families that are divorced, you know, missing fathers, missing mothers? How many people have had abusive experiences with father figures? You know, the meaning that they have for father might be pretty scary might be pretty traumatic when they think about, well, God's my father, what, what does that mean? It could hurt, that thought. So here we have a picture in scripture of a father who's not just a word carrying maybe meanings of, of yelling at me and abusing me and you know, or being cold and absent, but here's a picture of someone who calls himself father, who's eagerly waiting for me, who runs out, embraces me, brings me back into fellowship with the family. That can offer a corrective to some of these mistaken meanings. And it can actually make the difference if someone's really entered into it. And to start to say, maybe I can trust God the Father in a way that I can't trust you know, my earthly father because of these terrible experiences. Uh, and that can be a real opening for conversion and, and for healing. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's just so valuable is what you're saying there of understanding the true meanings of things, which is what a lot of this is about. And and you give a lot more other examples I wish we could have gotten into that really relate to students. You know, one being, you know, your student may think sin is wrong, but it's okay to have sleep with their girlfriend because they have a different understanding of what sin is. That sin is based on, you know, a negative effect on someone rather than sin is going against God's design and, and breaking that relationship with him and what he's created us to be. And so it's just so valuable to make sure that when we are having these conversations, that, that, that what we're talking about, the meaning 
behind the words, using our imagination for that, and then linking it to the truth, right? It's not just, I imagine this, therefore it's true. That's not what we're saying, but then linking exactly. it to the truth is so incredibly valued. So uh, Dr. Holly Orway, thank you so much for taking this time and, and helping me better understand this as well as those uh, listening and causing us to think deeper about Christianity and how it connects just to this deep beauty of literature and, and just in storytelling. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for having me on. And as we finish up, are there some websites or places that you uh, kind of want to encourage them to go to in, in, in your work with Word on Fire? Yeah, well, for uh, for my work on Word on Fire, um, they can just, you know, go ahead and Google Word on Fire Institute um, or check out wordonfire.org, which is where there's lots of free um, free resources. Um, and then if they want to follow my work specifically, they can go to my website, which is hollyordway.com. And there they'll find links to all the different things I've written and my work uh uh, we're, we're there. Awesome. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you very much. And thank you all so much for listening. I hope that again, that this week was encouraging to you, causing you to think deeper about Christianity and that you're able to learn from Dr. Ordway as well. Uh, just a reminder in the upcoming weeks, you know, connect, subscribe, hit that bell because in the next three weeks, Brian Chilton will be coming on, Mike Lacona and Dr. William Lane Craig will be joining to discuss the existence of God, arguments for Christianity, do a Q&A, looking at Bible contradictions and apologetics. And so those are interviews, hopefully, that will be an encouragement to you as you deepen your training and being a Christian ambassador. So thank you so much for joining this week, and I hope to see you guys again. Have a blessed rest of your day.